Right, so on all to feel us in devotion. Um, it's me. I'm back. Hello, after a long absence. Who, Who am I? I know. Yeah. I've been uh, gallivanting across France, um, following the Welsh rugby team, uh, and it's been successful. Uh, you know so- what? If you add a caravan into that, that is my worst nightmare. Right, wrapped all into a nice little package. Travelling around France, watching rugby. France is a beautiful country. Don't know what else you need. Weather, culture, uh, the French. French. The French are oh, they're great. Uh, outside of Paris, they're wonderful. But anyway, it's good to be back. Um, and what have I missed anyway? Still got a defense yeah, that leaks. Still got a defense that leaks like a sieve and scoring goals for fun. So, yeah. mm. not necessarily. Not this week. Not, not this week though. Yeah, two very, very very very. Solid results, two clean sheets. Um, Tim, you were down in Crawley. Give us your immediate reaction to to that result. Infinitely better than the Mansfield, where we were kind of lucky to escape with a point, really. Um, yeah, Crawley was overall much improved across the board, defensively better. Um, obviously, O'Connell came back into that back line for Tozu, who was rested. rested. Uh, and yeah, we, ju- we just looked... Decent. We sort of rode a look a little bit at times, but you do that in games. And I think uh, Big Arthur, a conquering goal. He's looking better with every game, looking more assured. I think he's giving that the defence a little bit more confidence. And that's nothing against Howard, because Howard's a very assured and accomplished goalkeeper. But his mere presence alone is always going to give you that extra reassurance about him, because he can pluck crosses without even... You know, getting off the ground with ease above everybody else. So, yeah, happy with the win. Great goal from from Big Ollie, uh, daft from Cannon to get sent off. And yeah, we finished finished really really well. Finished strongly. Maybe could have added a second goal, but yeah, decent days days work. Four points in a week from teams above us at that point in the table. So yeah, take that. Andy, um, I mean, a lot of the talk, obviously since I've been away, has been some couple of fairly calamitous results, obviously, um, but also high-scoring games that we've drawn uh, but conceded too many goals. I, I'm guessing pretty pleased that we look like we're tightening things up this last sort of week or two. Yeah, this is like the ghost of Dean Keats is back and we're grinding out uh, 1-0, 1-0 wins. And I, for one, am happy with that because it was we were too fast and loose. I've said it a few times. I think our full backs were too far up the pitch. I think it was putting our back three under a lot of pressure. I think we've tightened all that up now a little bit. I agree with Tim that the keeper has made a huge difference because it's good for a defence to know that they've got a keeper who can bail them out, who will either come in and grab something or make a great, uh, great, you know, point blank save. So yeah, he's going to get he's going to get better. I actually, more, I'm going to go a bit further than Tim. I actually think that's a a season changing result there. I, I had, I always had a feeling we'd go to Crawley and win. Um, I'm pleased with the manner we did do because I don't think really and truly we we gave them too many chances at all. Um, and I think that's just a credit to to the improved sort of work rate of the other side. Um, it was a brave call to take out Toza for a bit. His mum was in the pub after. She's hoping, you know, he's just, he's rested for a bit and he'll, he'll be raring to go pretty soon. You know, I think we all sort of know that he's had a lot going on behind the scenes and maybe you just want to to press a reset button for a bit. But I think defensively they did really well. Um, you know, we're waiting for people like McLean to really get into the system. He was great when we were down to 10, uh, but I still think he has to work into the into the wing-back role, really, because it's a lot for for to ask a player who's, who's that age, even though he's vastly experienced. Um, but I think he will come good because he's too good a player not to. Can we can we like rewind on how you knew it was Ben Toza's mum in the pub? We can't overlook that. Um, how did that conversation come about? Oh no, because uh, one of the girls was talking to to a lady at the bar, and she and she said, "Oh, it's just Ben Toza's mum." And I went, "Are you Ben Toza's mum?" She goes, "No." I went, "Oh, okay." <laughs> but then she said, "No, I am, I am, I am Ben's mum." Um, unfortunately, my train great banter. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> top banter, top top banter. Uh, but the thing is, my train was just about to come, so I had to sort of like, oh, oh hi, I hope he's okay. I hope you're all right. Uh, bye. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> wow. 
Uh, what was I going to say? Uh, before, I, before we go on, Andy, I don't think your microphone is... Um, I think you're coming through your laptop microphone. So we'll just do some... Try this. How's this? There we go. There, there he is. is. There he is. Um, now, I'm the only one with rubbish audio, but still. Um, no, I mean, really interesting thoughts. And I mean, the Salford now, we haven't got Barnet back, have we? Um, I love the way you call it Salford. Salford, sorry. I'm a simple southerner. Uh Right, Salford, uh, Saturday. You know, if Mendy's out, what what are we what what are our options? We do have an EFL league game before then. EFL no. trophy game against Crew. Um, Sorry, of course. Yeah. Um, so, be, I, I don't think that counts. I'm, I'm well, it does, doesn't it? It'll, it'll count if we get to Wembley and you're there in your Royal Box. So it will. It does no, count. What I mean by that is, I, I'm not sure if the suspension counts for that game. Someone put. I think it does. I think it does. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, there's going to be wholesale wholesale changes for that, isn't there? I mean, the ones that aren't weren't named, including the squad, will be able to feature in that. Hosanna, um, Billy Waters, and so on. So, yeah, but yeah, Mendy. Oh, I feel sorry for him. I feel sorry for him because he um, has been playing really well again and. I think he's overstretched for something. I think the pass was hit hard to him. He, he stretched out to to keep it into play. I think that's where he might have pulled something. But yeah, massive, massive, uh, massive setback. But is it, is it the curse of uh, Welcome to Wrexham? Because since he was being featured in the uh, documentary, he's got an injury. Who's who, who's next for the for the chopping block? Sean Harvey's going to pull a hammy. <laughs> or the bloke playing Sean Harvey in that ludicrous. Not, wear, not wearing those speedos. He's not. Or oh, the actor wearing those speedos is not Christ Almighty. Yeah. What, what, what have we have we discussed that episode yet, Andy? Uh, no, that, I mean we're halfway through. Welcome to Wrexham. Let's that, that, that's, that's go through it. That's sort of. I mean, how much have you seen first, Reese Gallivanting doing the worst thing in the world? So yeah, I I am. I don't think I'm fully up to speed. I think I'm one episode behind. I've watched most of it um, last over the last week. Um, I I I have really enjoyed. Um, Parts of it, uh, and I think parts of it have been really well done. I thought the episode on autism was fantastic, um, really well done. Um, I, I there was a couple of curveballs, and I in, in in that I I include um, Sean's holiday or whatever it was. Just at some stage, I just wasn't really really sure what I was watching. I don't know. It struck me a little bit self indulgent, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, and. At the end of the day, as well, we're all football fans, aren't we? So there's never going to be enough football in it, enough action in it to please us. But I still think maybe it's a little bit football light on occasion. I would like to see a bit more of the dressing room, a bit more uh, training, a bit more, yeah. you know, post match when we've lost or you know, celebrations, something like that. A bit of so we can see the character of the players as well on the pitch, not just off the pitch. It's great seeing them off the pitch. I love seeing Paul Mullin, you know, and getting to know him better. Um, in his personal life, but also I want to see what makes them tick. I want to see, it was nice to see, like, you know, some of my favourite bits so far were some of those clashes in the changing room where you had that scene where Mullin and sort of Toza were clashing and I was like, that's great, you know, just see a bit of that sort of meat um, from uh, from sort of on, on the field side of things. But I don't know, what do you think? Um, parts of this doc make me want to cry and in, in, in two ways. <laughs> um, some I like you. I think it's patchy. I think in, when it's good, it's very, very good. Uh, and when it's bad, it, it makes it makes my skin crawl a little bit. I mean, what what I mean by that is like I thought the episode four, the the Sean Harvey's holiday, was everything I didn't want this documentary to be. Constructed reality, piss taking. You know, look at these idiots trying to run a football club. No, we're better than that. Um, I didn't like that at all. I thought the best bit was about the Mullins boots. I thought that was a good part of it. But then I also think, I think really and truly episode one, because they're changing the timelines around so much, paint themselves into a corner a little bit because the Sean, the, 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 the big thing about the Mullins boots was, could it derail the, the government funding? And you, you couldn't, we couldn't say that because we'd already said in episode one that they weren't getting the government funding and playing around with the timeline is, I understand why they're doing it narratively, um, but I think a lot of people now are so invested in 
in the club that they know this timeline and even some of the new American fans know it quite well. So even they're questioning why we're, we're bouncing around so much on top of that, there has been some, some, some scenes and some, some parts of this, of this season that have been absolutely brilliant. I mean, the, the Millie going through Millie tipping, going through the care package for, for Paul Mullins son and, and just sort of going, well, this really helped me. I hope it's going to help. I'll be. I mean, that was just so well done, and so, 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 sort of, so it, it makes you burst with pride. I read the reviews. I, I went on 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 Thursday, and I've read all the reviews about it, and I was I I was bursting with pride about about the show and how it's representing us, and you know, the good bits are so very, very, very good. Yeah, it just it, it that the that fourth episode just felt odd didn't it because it because it because it was it was almost quite incongruous it was like well what's this doing here i don't understand where where this episode has come from but uh, who knows maybe the american audience and lots of other people loved it we'll see let us know email us tweet us uh what's the email these days tim f-i-d-z-i-n-e at gmail.com as it stands um, Tim, che- Tim checks it every three months, so please email us. Oh, I, don't, I don't even get to check it, but that's a long story. That's that's a story for another time. I'll tell you about that after. Oh, we're going to have to um, write a third email. My say on that one quickly, before we bring our guest yeah, in, yeah, yeah. is um, I, I, I've, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm the exception to the rule, but I, I'm not asked about not seeing what goes on in the dressing room because I think there's an element of stuff you have to protect. I think there's an element of, of within that football circle that you have to stay clear from. And I think Park has learned his lessons from the Sunderland documentary where he wants to keep a certain element cut off. Like, this is our bubble. This is our sacred part, which we don't want to let the cameras into. Allow tidbits, but not the whole thing. Then it becomes an all or nothing documentary. Totally so, get that. Exactly, no, you're right. Exactly, yeah. It's exactly the same as anybody else. And I get it. And you're never going to you're never gonna satisfy both because you could then go, you could get, then give a couple of episodes that are pure, pure football, football, football in the dressing room, everywhere. And people go, oh, but I'm missing I'm missing out on the characters now. I want to know about the... About... So you're never going to get the right balance, I think. The only the only thing I would probably agree with where the complaints are is, you know, this is our record-breaking title-winning season, 111 points. People are saying, we're not, we're not seeing that much football. I kind of see where that's coming from, but I dare say we're going to see more and more as the, as the season... Unravel. I think I think it's I think it's building to something. I think yeah, I think it yeah. needs to. Now I think once we get the doc in, we'll sort of talk about what what the next episode. Uh, sorry, we'll get the guest in. We'll talk about what the next episode might be. And I think he he features in it in, in it quite heavily. So shall I bring him in, lads? Yes, let's yes. bring him in. Please do, and I'll have to take my leave. So please enjoy oh, this. Where are you now? You're not still in France, are you? Uh, I'm not. I'm not still in France. I'm in a, a undisclosed location, as you might be able to tell with my background, but um. I'll, I'll tell you next week. Stay tuned. Take nice. care. Okay. You yeah, take care. One in, one out. See you, Reese. Hi, what? Neil. How yeah. are you? One in, one in, one out. So. You okay? Yeah. Before, before. So just, just for those on an audio um, propensity, we're now joined by propensity. Mr. Neil. Propensity is a good word. Scrabble. Yeah. Don't scoff at me. Right. Oh, so Neil go. Roberts. Neil Roberts. Wrexham legend. I'm going to say Wales legend. You're going to think differently, but I'm going to say it anyway, right? Um, current star in, in brackets. Welcome to Wrexham, season two. Uh, Neil, thank you so much, mate, for giving up your time this morning. You know, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. It's all right. How are you? Are you well? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just um, just been to watch some uh, under, under sixes football. My friend's son was playing this morning and, uh, at the Cloet Dog School in, uh, in Wrexham, so... That was quite nice. The weather's good, and uh, yeah. yeah, it was nice to get out and about a little bit. Un- unseasonably warm for this for this yeah, time yeah. of year. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, um, Andy, I'll, I'll chuck it over to you. Yeah, basically, Neil, we've been talking about the the, the documentary. We're about halfway through. It's like uh, what we feel of it so far. I think our sort of general thing is there's been a few dodgy bits. But when it's good, it is so good. And yeah. I'm going to pick out two examples. One I've said about Millie Tipping going through her her care package for for Paul Mullins lad. I thought that was beautifully done and, and yeah. lovely, beautifully observed. Another part of it I really liked was you and your daughter going through the scrapbook. I thought that was so good that your mum had done that. That 
you and you and Mia can can go through that now. And you know, as you sort of said, that there may be some pages at the end. I, I did actually think, um, you know, they were, we paused on a we paused on a on a page. It was Neil's captain's pledge. I thought, did I write that? I had to actually uh, pause it and go right up to the screen to see if that was me. Um, no, it wasn't. It was uh, I think it was about a year after I left that paper. Ah, but, right, okay. But I just loved I just loved that. Um, I mean. But you did sort of touch a little bit about how how your last sort of years with Wrexham sort of affected you. And I think, yeah. I, I know we touched on it last time you came across, but I mean, you must know that, you must know the love that the town and the fans have for you. Yeah, I, um, I'm, yeah, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm a, eternally grateful to, uh, to those that do support in the right fashion. Um, I would never sort of um, speak about some of the things that happened um, and I wouldn't refer to them as fans anyway. So it's, it, it's kind of, it's two different things really for me. You know, I'm, uh, I, I really, really sort of uh, um, appreciate and um, I'm, I'm grateful for, for all the love and support that I've had from, uh, from, from Wrexham fans and, um, Unfortunately, and there's always going to be there's there's going to be a few that uh, that fall through the cracks, if you like, and are able to sort of affect either me or, or or my family. And I think that was just something that I think probably more so more than me. I think Mia wanted to sort right. of express as well because um, sometimes you forget and you you do end up in your own sort of bubble that there's a bigger picture. You know, um, you know, I've got three young children. I've got you know, brothers, I've got, you know, my mum and dad and, you know, my, uh, my, the children's mum as well, that they, they were all affected. So, um, it's, uh, it's just, it's just one of those things, I think that, you know, a few people have asked me about it recently. And I just said that I just thought it was the right moment to just kind of be open and honest. And, you know, the scenes that you see of Mia speaking, I wasn't present so she did a lot of filming when I wasn't there. So I didn't know what had been said, and and you never know how it's going to be edited as well. That's yeah. that, that's a big sort of piece of it. So um, so yeah, it was um, the build up to it. I was anxious before I watched it, um, and I didn't watch it till late Wednesday night because I was super busy. But um, I'd had a few messages, and and that was kind of. It was quite nice for me to get those messages before I was, yeah, yeah, because yeah, because like I say, I was I was anxious and uh, maybe he's a little bit unsure of myself if or what have I what have I said and things like that. So yeah, it's nice to come through it now, sort of thing, and kind of go, oh, actually, it, it it's come across maybe it's how how we wanted it to, you know. So what I just want to do is just sort of sum it up because we've got a lot of new fans who sort of yeah. are, are, are following Wrexham and, and are tuning into the podcast. So obviously Neil, mm. a local lad from from Gavin Village, wasn't it? Um, yeah. So played played for the club, came through the youth team, um, was a great servant for us over a number of years. Uh, played for Wales as well, a four caps, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then helped the club by making a big money move to, to Wigan. So we got yeah. a lot of, we got a lot of cash in for, for Neil who really helped the club when we needed it. Uh, Neil came back to us a couple of years after playing, playing away a little bit and was captain in the side when we were struggling at the wrong end of, of, of the table. Now I don't think any, anyone really, I mean, I certainly didn't, didn't blame you for anything that was going on. There was so much going on behind the scenes, which you mm. couldn't really influence, but, being a local lad who lived locally, I think Neil took a lot of undue criticism from 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 passionate fans who didn't want to see the club club get relegated. And I think, you know, you talked about it last time you were here, but again in the documentary, it's just there was a little bit of a an outpouring of sort of, you know, how it how it sort of affected you, and you know, in some ways continues to to affect yeah. you a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, no, listen, it's a, I probably couldn't have put it any better, to be fair. So, uh, you know, that summary sort of captures it all. But, um, but yeah, I, um, yeah, I think it was just, um, just a case of maybe the personality and the, the sort of my, my sort of core values are, are one that have taken responsibility first and foremost. And, 
And then, you know, a number of things like you alluded to were out of all the players' control, not just mine. And um, yeah, unfortunately, I think um, I think it was just a case of uh, you know there was it was fighting a losing battle in many ways. And um, you know that said, I still don't believe that our our performances were good enough anyway because you always have to be honest and you have to analyze and you have to reflect and you know when i do look back i think you know we could have we could have done better particularly in some situations so um yeah like you say it's um it's something that happened you know and a good few years ago now but it does still linger um and the nice thing for me or hopefully the nice thing for me is that um the successes of what Phil is is currently doing with the team and what they've done last season is uh, is slowly but surely putting a few ghosts to uh, to bed. So yeah. to speak. I mean, we're so much better dealing with mental health now, aren't we? With yeah. not just not you know not not just footballers, but but overall. I mean, that was back in two thousand and. And, and seven, and I don't know if you know if you needed or wanted help at that time. Would you know what to do? And and is it a lot different now? Yeah, it's it's massively different because it's because it's spoken about. It's and it, you know that's a good thing. But you know, I remember a couple of games into the season, and um, well, it was probably about probably maybe about ten games in, and I just remember walking around the race course with um, we had a we had a fitness coach called Andy O'Boyle who's now actually at Manchester United and, you know, done really well for himself. Um, and I just remember after one of the fi- one of the games, just walking around the pitch with him, just talking and and kind of feeling a sense of um, just a lack of control over, over sort of what was happening. And, you know, we had a few good moments and it was sort of that when people talk about the roller coaster ride, it was very much like you kind of knew that there was a big dip coming and and you were just you were just on this sort of or in this washing machine type cycle of of kind of not being able to you know even buy a win sort of thing. So um, yeah, it's um, thankfully there's a lot more sort of uh, a lot more support now, um, and and rightly so because ultimately footballers um, are, are the same as you know. Postmen, teachers, you know it. Everybody, everybody is is in the same boat, so to speak. There's pressures in whatever you do, and you know footballers are no different. They they still have families, they still have responsibilities, and you know it's um it's important that they're not treated any differently, if you like. Neil, um, I don't want to sort of labour the point, and obviously, the relegation was painful for everybody. I mean, you mm. can, that that was clear clear to see, um. I know you said you didn't want to get into to the, the extremities of, of, of the of the stick you take, and mm. that's that, that's inexcusable. Then it's inexcusable now, and, and it still goes on. I suppose what, what I was going to ask is, you know, as a local lad, and you, and you fast forward it to the current day, and you've got players like like Jordan Davis, you know, yeah. uh, local locally born. When he's had, when it's not been going right for him on on the, on the pitch, it, it you know, as we found out before. It's it's been alluded to things that have been going on off the pitch as well. He's had a lot of tragedy in his life in, in recent yeah. years, and he's come through it. But he's come through with not just the strength of his family and his and his and his uh, work colleagues, but of the management. I think Phil Parkinson's mm-hmm. put his arm around him and said, "Look, if you need need a break, you're going to have that break." Yeah. Did you have Did you have any support at that time from the management structure, or was it a case? It's you know. It's one of those things, as we've gone down, we'll go again next year and regroup. But not knowing, did you know at that point if you were going to be shown the door for that season? So so the two-part question, I guess, is was there any sort of rounded support? Did you have that that sort of arm around the shoulder and said, look, you know, try not to worry about it or dwell on it too much? Or did you have to deal with it largely on your own? Um, I think... I think it'd be unfair to say that there wasn't support there because unless you ask, nobody knows that you're struggling. Yeah. So I was very much somebody that hid it very well. Um, and I was able to do that sort of okay, by just kind of that, that, that deep breaths and kind of going in and putting the front on. And, um, you know, in, in many ways, you know, I didn't, I didn't shy away from it. I kept kind of doing 
if there was ever sorry to fly um if there was ever sort of um an event to be done where they needed somebody to go and speak or q and a's or whatever then then I'd still do it and i i wasn't i didn't shy away from that I just think that when I was back in my own space that's where it sort of you know kind of for me was 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 difficult um in particular when you when you spend a lot of time on your own and and you do start reflecting on on what's gone on or what's been said or um maybe it's what's to come as well you know that's always a big thing especially with footballers when you when you're playing and you know ultimately you're only ever on a one two or a three year contract and mm. you know it's quite similar to a lot of people in in, in different industries in that you're constantly sort of thinking about what the what ifs. Um, and I think there were, there, there were just, that was just probably one of a number of factors that sort of had an effect on not only me and, you know, this isn't just about me. It's, I'm sure there were other lads as well that were, that were feeling similar, if not the same. And maybe they just haven't had the platform to, to openly discuss it, you know? So, mm. Um, yeah, I think, um, like I say, like I started with, I think it'd be unfair to say there wasn't support because you have to ask for support for them to know you're struggling. Um, and then, and then really the, the second part of your question, I guess is I, I probably chose to bury my head in the sand and mm. like a lot of people do. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm sure there were enough good people at the club at the time that, that perhaps could have could have helped a little bit, you know? Yeah. And I see what you're saying there. I mean, on the flip side as well, I see what you're saying about having to ask for support, but on the flip side, it should be a club responsibility to offer support regardless, especially when the chips are down and things are what happened. But that's perception, isn't it? And there's different things. There different... is. And I think we've said before, and I've spoken to you guys a number of times, is that we didn't learn from on pitch. Mm. We didn't learn from off pitch either. So, so that, all all those sort of things coming together, it's sort of that's a it's a pretty negative place to be, you know. If you kind of go right, okay, we survived, and you go on holiday, and and that's kind of what what happened. Yeah. And then, and then you kind of automatically you think, well, we're starting afresh. You're not starting afresh. You're starting mm -hmm. where you finished, and that was yeah. bottom of the league. And yeah. you have to kind of put things in place before you get back to pre season and. Throughout preseason, you have to make the right decisions. You have to say the right things. You have to do the right things. And yeah, we um, we didn't do any of that. Not only on pitch, but off pitch as well. So um, yeah, yeah, it's a there's a there's a collective responsibility as well. So you know. before before the decision was made, technically for you in terms of your time at Wrexham coming to an yeah. end for a second time, did you have any idea in your head that? I want to stay and supposedly right the wrongs as opposed in your head of, yeah. of what happened. Or did you think maybe it's time for me to go and have a fresh start and, and just press reset? Well, well, no, the, you know, the, the honest truth is that Brian Little got me in and, um, and told me that there was, um, there was a player coach role uh, okay. available to me. And uh, he'd like to, he'd like to sort of support me on my journey if I wanted to into the coaching world. And, that was just something that was in the back of my mind, but it would never really been a passion of mine, if you like. Um, you know, I was I was good friends with Steve Stevie Cooper, and I'd always taken a young a young team at the academy on a Sunday morning. But it was more so out of sort of just just wanting to do something with the club as opposed to having a passion for coaching. You know, um, I wasn't one of those that wanted to be on the grass every day, sort of thing. I think. I think if there was ever going to be a, a role for me, it would have been potentially a management role with some superb coaches alongside sort of thing. And yeah, um, yeah I, uh, you know, Brian had said that to me, obviously I'm, I'm, I like to trust people and, and take them for their word. And, um, and then unfortunately the way it panned out was, I think I got presented with the player of the season award the night before the fans player. And then, mm. and then I got, I got released the next day. But but my my release was um, so I, it was a release retained day as standard at most clubs at Colliers Park. I drove uh, I drove down to Colliers 
and uh, as kind of per normal, would always stop to speak to the ground staff on the way in and have a bit of banter um, and just have a chat. And and Stuart Webber um, was there and he said, I'm really sorry to hear the news. And I said, what news? And he was kind of like, oh, you don't know. And that that was how I found out. So it wasn't wow. through the manager. Um, they were waiting for me in the building. I think I was first on, which was why I saw the ground staff sort of going out into the pitches. So, um, yeah, I walked in um, and super, super difficult. But I, I just thought to myself, right, you've got to control and you've got to stay in control of the situation. Don't get angry. And, um, yeah, I walked in and Martin Foyle, Brian Carey and, and Brian Little were waiting for me. And I just said... Uh, if I can just say something before you uh, before you start to speak, um, you know, I've, I've just heard in the car park that that I've been released. And uh, I said, I, I really hope you don't do that to anybody else, especially any of the young players that might be having bad news. Um, and I shook I shook their hand and uh, and that was kind of me. I said, I wish you well. I hope you get back in the league. And that was my that was my sort of end to my Wrexham career sort of thing, finding out in the car park. So it was a, it was a, I think I say, said this on the documentary, like there was a few sort of tough pills to swallow. And that was probably, probably the toughest because I just felt that, well, that's just been a throwaway conversation over a cup of tea and a biscuit, right. maybe in the canteen or something. And I th I felt I deserved a lot better than that. So, yeah, unfortunately that happened. And yeah, like I say, I just I just asked them not not to do that to anyone else because I think maybe uh, maybe it might have been a different outcome if they'd done it to other people. You know. Yeah. Well, um, so go, go on, Tim. I was going to say before we 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 uh, we, we lighten the the mood for one yeah. of the better <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to. Uh, to uh, <laughs> <laughs> to go into the to go into the the Wales stuff in a minute. Yeah, um, I just well, I, I you know I think I speak on behalf of me, Andy, Reese, Liam, um, and most Wrexham fans, if not all, despite the experiences you you had many many years ago and all that unfolded, like you should feel massively proud of what you achieved at the club, massively, right? And I don't think, I think I think sometimes you don't give you. I said I said this to you the other day, so I don't think sometimes you don't give yourself the credit you deserve. You know, because you did really well. You got the move that you deserved. And everybody, and I still remember to this day when that move happened, like discussing it in the turf, and everybody, everybody was like that. It was like it was like it was like a proud parent evening of people going, I oh, was so happy for him, so happy for him, he deserves it. So yeah. having that yeah. and that money that comes into the club helps us immeasurably. Then to come back when you didn't have to come back, right? You didn't have to come back. It's as simple as that. You come back, trying to fight the good fight. It doesn't happen. You're given the captaincy because you are a leader. They give you the captaincy for that reason. So I think it's important from our point of view that you kind of don't lose sight of that. I'm sure you haven't, but that's our that's my little pep talk to you. Well, no, <laughs> listen, I, guys, I uh, I really appreciate it. It, you know, I, I suppose I've just been I've been somebody that's never ever sort of I'm I'm I loved. I loved playing for Wrexham. Absolutely loved it. I love watching now. Um, you know, it's great for me to sort of gone full circle and become a, a fan again without the sort of playing responsibilities. Um, and yeah, I, I, I guess I just, I've always liked to be sort of considered a team player as opposed to somebody who was very much about, about me and, and forget everything else sort of thing. So I don't really take care uh, I don't really take uh, compliments too good, um, <laughs> but but that said, I, you know I I do appreciate it, and uh, you know I'm uh, I'm I'm really thankful for uh, for everything you just said. It's uh, treat it as a tribute, not a compliment. There's two different things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing I would say, Neil, is obviously after that, you know, what when you've been released in that way, you need to go away for a couple of years and just forget about Wrexham. But it, yeah. it's beautiful symmetry that you're able. 
to come back now. You're in the documentary. You can yeah. go as a fan. Obviously, Mia was there as well, and that that was a nice sort of circle circle of it all. I mean, just to, to talk about the documentary a little bit. I mean, how, how did yeah. you get approached? I mean, is it is it um, something that they came to to you via via Mia, and they just like the story of the the daddy and the daughter who uh, both both play for Wrexham? Yeah, but I to be honest with you, the um... The, I think the first contact, the initial contact was um, was Mia was obviously in the Wrexham sort of uh, under 19s and, and training and they started to, the crew started to turn up at that. Um, so she got into a bit, little bit of dialogue and um, they were obviously new to town and didn't really know who was who and uh, and sort of the situation behind Mia as well, I guess, that that both her, her dad and her uncle had uh, had played for and uh, and capped in the club. So um, so once once that was sort of out there, I then bumped into one of the producers from the first series. Um, I bumped into him in the gym in uh, Carden Park and um, randomly got talking and he explained why he was there and we just we just kept in touch and um, a guy called John Henyon and. Um, yeah, he was just a lovely guy. He was asking loads of questions, really interested. And then the next thing, um, yeah, we were asked if we'd consider doing some filming together, but also also sort of a part as well. So, uh, like I said before, some of the it's great for me to see some of the things that Mia's done on her own and and listen to her. And you know, she's uh, yeah, she she sort of excelled all expectations really in terms of how she's handled it and. You know, especially because it's not easy being the daughter of either, even though I'm not sort of, you know, we're not talking about Kenny Daglish and his son Paul. We're not, you know, it's not that sort of level, but still for, you know, a small town sort of place, um, a lot of people knew me from the football world. And obviously my children kind of get attached, get associated with that. So there's always going to be conversations that, they're going to be dragged into what happened, What? why did he do this, why didn't he score, why didn't he, you know, going to school every day, teachers asking, you know, and there's there's a lot of pressure that that goes on them as well. So the three of them have handled it brilliantly. Um, and, and I know, I know my other two were a little bit disappointed that I hadn't changed the photos that were captured on the mantelpiece of them when they were little. So I'm in a little bit of trouble for that. Um, but... But no, the the whole process, if you like, has been one of sort of a an, a new friendship group with the documentary crew. They um they've just been, and I know you guys know them, but it's like they they've just been really really great people. Every single one of them has become a Wrexham fan, which I love. Yeah, that's um, good. Yeah, absolutely. You know, every single one of them is genuine, is sincere, uh, is trustworthy, which is massive for me because I think when you're especially when you start opening up about things you haven't really spoken about previously, as in whether it be mental health, whether it be personal family situations, et cetera. And you do have to kind of have that level of trust to bring them into your sort of circle of trust. So, um, so I was more than happy to do that with these guys. Um, they were, like I say, they were fabulous to work with. And um, yeah, we've, uh, I think this, I think the sort of full circle piece that you mentioned is is really quite bizarre because I can start now having a sense of how my mum and dad felt when I yeah. played, um, and then you know, um, you know, unfortunately, Mia's gone through in in a similar way what I went through from a release sort of mm. situation, and it wasn't wasn't done in the in the most sensitive of ways, and. Um, I think the documentary is has kind of a little bit clawed back a little bit of confidence for her because she was she was put through the mill a little bit with the with the lead up to the decisions on who's getting the contract and whatnot and I couldn't control it again. I could see it happening before my eyes and I knew what was coming because I'd been there before and I thought she wanted to handle it herself and you know, as a with my with my parents' hat on, you forget about supporting Wrexham Football Club. You 
you have to care for your daughter and 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 that was tough it was a tough one to see her getting released after playing there you know a really a really big part of a couple of years within the the, the women's and the under 19s team so um so yeah it's um football's not it's not all ups is it you know it's there's plenty of downs and um i think you have to talk about them and it's it's sort of a I think I think it adds to the the documentary, if I'm honest, in that well, actually, there's a piece of that story that it didn't end particularly yeah. well from a football on pitch standpoint. However, she's in university, she's loving life, living in Manchester, and uh, potentially she's uh, she's going to come back into the game in a different capacity and uh, and do extremely well for herself, which I've every confidence she will. Fantastic. Fantastic, um, Neil. Let's 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 go on to the Wales thing. And the reason I'm going on to the Wales thing is because obviously Wrexham finally play host to another Wales international, albeit yeah. a friendly this week against Gibraltar. Um, the games at the racecourse have been few and far between over the mm. last couple of decades. It's been a while. I think the last one prior to this one was 2018 against Trinidad Tobago. Yeah. Um, take us right back because. It was only. It was. I say it's only four caps. However, I I think it's quite. I completely forgot about this. Four of those caps, three of them were away. Yeah. And one of them, one of them was at the race course. So you never actually played in Cardiff or anything like that at the time. No. So, um, just take a sweet. What what division were we in at the time when we, when you got selected? Was it League One or League Two? I can't think off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, it would have been League One. Yeah. Um. Okay. But it, yeah, so that's the last official international game at the race course, isn't it? 24 years yeah. ago this week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Crazy. yeah, it's um yeah, I didn't realise that until somebody had told me this week. So um yeah, um again, you know, getting getting a call up for your country for anybody is is obviously is obviously up there as being the pinnacle of your of your career. And um, you know, probably probably for me, I think um I always keep them on a par. So my Wrexham debut and my Wales debut, I find it very difficult to put one above the other. As patriotic as I am, and you know, I've been away with Wales. I've, I've been, the, I've done the fan bit, and obviously, having played from is super special. But I still keep the Wrexham, the Wrexham debut as sort of my, sort of super super pride because, yeah. you know, the the Welsh one was was one that yes, I I got four caps, and you know, those were sort of quite sort of short cameo appearances. Um and I'm I'm very proud of that. But um I think um yeah I think on the whole for me I was like a it was like a schoolboy's dream sort of to go into a changing room with some of the likes of you know Gary Speed, you know, Ryan Giggs, no, Bellamy no. John Adson, um, you know, Robbie Savage being a local lad, you obviously knew him anyway, but but still Chris Coleman and people like that that the the amazing thing with with when I when I got my debut is I played the night before against them um, at at Newtown for the under twenty ones in a in a in a game and and Mark Hughes the then manager of the first team uh, came into the changing rooms and asked me to join up the next day with um, with the first team so that was probably you know probably the best way for it to happen as well that you know. And this is what I'm hoping for Paul Mullin is that he gets that sort of shout, um, sort of maybe he's late on because it takes away sort of all the not yeah. all of it, but it takes away some of the pressures, if you like, of of the build up into it. And especially with it being at Wrexham. Um, yeah, I think I missed I missed quite a lot of intense scrutiny on who's this kid, you know, what's he all about? And then and then maybe you forget about the game so much. So I just went into it grab the opportunity. Yes, I was on the bench, but if I got on, I was going to grab my moment. And yes, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. it. It went so quick. It went, it was like a flash, but you know, I got my debut for Wales. All my family were there. All my friends were there. And obviously, you know, it was a, there was a big cohort of Wrexham fans. So it, it just made it, made it super special. Which kind of leads me to, to the next question really on this one is, um, I mean, I'm fighting the good fight with Mullin on Twitter uh, amongst all 
the the South they Wales based fraternity, yeah. shall we say? Yeah. I've yeah. I've described it as some sort of South Wales snobbery. Some people will argue otherwise. Surely, right? If you are good enough and you are you've hit in what eighty one goals in a hundred and two hundred three games, right? Yeah. And we haven't got that type of player in the squad. No. Um, I mean... At what point do we say enough is enough? And and like because. You know, surely he's. I'm. I'm trying to take my bias away from this and, mm. and go right. Look at it objectively. If I was in front of Rob Wells and I, I had no affiliation to any Cardiff, Swansea, Wrexham, whoever, yeah. and I saw this player getting mentioned, saw him scoring week in week out, would I want him called up for Wales? At what point do we take off our rose tinted spectacles and go? We need him. We don't have the pot of players we had. Yeah, I, I've spoken about this a couple of times, and I, I've I've sort of. Um... I've been I've been involved in a few spats on Twitter about this as well, but which I which I love because there's no getting away from a proven goal scorer. Facts are facts, goals are there, they don't lie. Um also, if you look at and this is this is probably the biggest thing for me, is if you look at some of Paul's performances, um, and you can't take away the goals, you can't forget about the goals, but if you look at some of his performances against better, so-called better teams in the FA Cup, etc., he was the best player on the pitch. Now that's that's not that's not me being biased. That's being really honest and open about a player that not only scores goals, he creates opportunities for others. He's quick, he's brave, and he always always gets chances. And the reason he always gets chances is because he plays more often than not within the within the sort of. Uh, with the goalpost, he's a fo- he's he's a fox in the box, but he can also do stuff outside of the box. He can create something out of nothing, and he he for me is is what we're missing. As you know, as a Welsh team, you know, and I know, like I think, it's keep keep us suspended for. Uh, I think yeah, he suspended the last one. I think he might be, one, so he might be back first, Yeah, I'd love to see him play an off keeper. I'd yeah. love to see something like that because that it would work. It definitely would work. And the one thing with Mullers is being like for me is like he will get a chance, and it wouldn't surprise me if he gets on the bench on um, this week. He'll score. He will score. Um, and he's got so much confidence that it's it's just gonna it, it'll light the race course up, won't it? You know what it'll be like. The fans will be. You know, chant his name, and it's just. I I don't think Pagey cannot give him an opportunity because I, I think if he ignores it completely, I think I think he'll come under even more scrutiny from a sort of, especially from a North Wales point of view. You know, so. Um, I mean, he, for me, it seems set up that he, that he needs to come into the squad. I mean, he set it up on standby. He knows he's going to lose a few. It always happens, yeah. especially. Yeah. Especially after you know the latest round of um, of games, so yeah. you know it seems set up for Paul to come in and play some minutes at, at at the race course where he's so good. You know he's been great for us, but he is so good at home rather yeah. rather in the way that's where he really comes alive. Um, yeah. yeah, like you, I can't see why he wouldn't, and I do think he he gives what Wales are missing. He scores all types of goals, absolutely headers, left yeah. foot, right foot, inside the box, outside the box. I mean, it, it doesn't matter the his age or anything like that. You know, some people are late developers, aren't they? Yeah, yeah of course they are. But, and again, you've got to ask yourself, how many championship clubs would take Paul Mullin now? I tell you what, 75% would take Paul Mullin because of his goal-scoring attributes alone. You know, forget everything else. And, and that's kind of, that tells a story because we haven't got the luxury of, the choice of 10, 15, 20 centre forwards. Um, you know, we we work from a small pot and what have we got? We've probably got between, I would say, out and out centre forwards. We've probably got, I would say, six maybe potentially at a push. But that includes Paul Mullin. Um yeah. that can go into a team and hold their own and and perform and potentially, you know, um score goals for us. So it's not a lot, is it? And uh, if championship clubs would take him tomorrow, which they would, then how can he not get an opportunity with, with the Welsh team? Oh, I'm excited now. <laughs> now you've said that, I was like, yeah, I really want it to happen. Now you've said it, I'm like, it's going to happen, isn't it? Wednesday, Wednesday <laughs> the coronation. 
I'm going to have to ring Pagey. He's going to have to get a message right. or something from me. Yeah, I, I didn't like that comment about it. it's the next stage of his development. Mate, he's 28. He doesn't need any more developing. Just shove him in. Um, yeah. Oh, the coronation of the King of Merseyside on Wednesday. It's happening. <laughs> if, if it's happening in Neil Roberts' head, it's happening. It's a fact. Let's hope so. Yeah. Let's hope so. Um, anyway, uh, Neil, whether you want to stick around or whether you want to go, it's entirely up to you. We, we, we're wrapping up shortly anyway. But Dan Rowe from uh, Andy's Man Club, um, the Wrexham branch, which is a... Uh, a men's suicide prevention charity is joining us. Obviously, we've touched on the uh, the mental health aspect already, so it's just a, a sort of continuing theme of that. So, Dan, thanks for joining us. Sorry for keeping you waiting. It's my pleasure. Thanks for the invite, guys. It's all right. So just, just give us a bit of uh, insight, Dan, as to what, if anybody doesn't know what Andy's Man Club is, what it is, um, and why we're specifically talking about it a little bit more going into next week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Andy's Man Club are a men's mental health and suicide prevention charity. We've been around since 2016. We started in Halifax, um, actually at the Shea Stadium um, in, in Halifax, following the, the tragic suicide of a young 23-year-old lad called Andy Roberts. Had his whole life ahead of him um, and tragically, like so many, um, especially men do nowadays, um, took, took his own life. His, his brother-in-law, a chap called Luke Amblo, is a professional rugby league player who played for Halifax, hence the reason the Shea connection, um, wanted to create something in which guys can go along and be guys, but also be in a space where it just became normal to talk. We all go through stuff within our life. We all go through good times. We all go through bad times, stress and and, and a variety of different things that happen. But actually, when we look at it, where where is healthy for men to, to, to actually go? Like a, a lot of people, I probably go, to the race course and and scream and shout at various different individuals about how well, depending on what is going on at um to, to kind of release some of that frustration but in in the in the long run actually being able to open up and, and realize that it's just normal i think is the, the the biggest thing um we we like i said we started off with one club on monday night we'll have 154 clubs across the uk we oh. see three, three and a half thousand men walk through our door every single week it's completely free of charge it's every monday from seven till nine. Wow. Okay. So where where's the Wrexham one based? There? Obviously, we, we, we'll we'll put all of the links and everything up after. But in terms of people can go to Andy's Man Club website address and all that, and it'll be listed there. Everything. Yeah, absolutely. So our Wrexham club is hosted at Yellow and Blue, and and I just want to kind of take a second actually just to, to to mention how grateful we are for Pete Humphreys and his team at Yellow and Blue. I know they're going through some tough times, especially financially. Um, at the moment, we've, we've been there for 18 months since we launched the Wrexham Club and they, they provide us with their space completely free of charge. Um, so if, if people are able to, to kind of give some back so they can continue supporting that community. Um, also for, for the Wrexham fans um, anywhere in the UK, you can also access our online group. Um, so to do that, you just need to email info at andysmanclub.co.uk. But like I said, there's 154 clubs across the UK. Um, so do check out our website to find out where your local ones and and actually we're really proud lots of football clubs support us so if you look at a lot of where our clubs are they're actually within football clubs so Neil to take your old club Wigan Athletic um, and yeah. they're huge fans of what the, the amount of stuff that they've done together with the rugby league team there it, it's just been incredible since we launched um, oh, yeah. and within Wrexham we see probably 30 to 35 guys a week now um, that come through the doors there. So it just goes to show you're not alone within the within the area. It's really important. I think the stigma of it is is getting less and less now, isn't it? About this whole that whole term of man up, which drives me mad. Like it just, you know, it, not so long ago, I would I would use that term. I'm sure all of us have in one respect or another. And then you start to realise the the effect that word that phrase can have and what it means and, and the sort of the ramifications of it. So. You know, I can't speak for, for for the other guys. And Neil's touched on it before, and I've tried to put myself in his position. Like, imagine if that was you. You loved the club, and you got stick for it. You know, and it, it happens on on Twitter. You know, I, I've put some stuff up before, not thought about it. It's not been malicious, and I've got absolute pelters for it. Yeah. And you, you go, oh, I've got that wrong. But then some of the heat you get is grim. It's grim, and it has a. It does have a have an effect. You know, I won't lie. It's, it's definitely an effect on me in the past. And you have to kind of take a step away. So it's so good that that these um, initiatives and schemes and, and charities like Andy's Man Club are in place now to help that. Um, 
have, have you noticed like, like a big sea change over the last, I mean, how many years is it now where you're seeing more and more people come in? And I imagine it's not just, it's not just, you know, you, you sort of guy, timid bloke that would come in and say, I've got a few issues. I imagine you're getting the stereotypical macho dude with tattoos on his neck that is, is almost, you know, it, well, I, I couldn't possibly have mental health, but I take it you're getting people of all creeds and colors and shapes and sizes coming through the doors. Absolutely. Uh, to, to walk through our doors, all you need to do is be a man and be 18 and over. That that That's kind of the only requirement. You go into some of these really tough places like Wrexham, tough places to live, tough tough upbringings, um, tough environment. And we all will have different struggles. So I would say that our clubs are probably filled with more of the people like you've just described there than people that turn up in suits. Um, if anyone actually wears a suit anymore to work, but anyway, um, but but yeah, no, it's it's filled with with all demographics, uh, with all backgrounds, with 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 yeah, and and it's it's really important, but it's really heartwarming because when you go through the door, you you meet a bunch of strangers, and without sounding like a cliche, some of my best mates I've met through Andy's Man Club, and um, I've been involved with the charity five and a half years, and and I walked through the door two days after making a third suicide attempt. And it was something that I saw no way out. Like I saw literally no way of 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 life ever getting better. And kind of walking through the door, I didn't feel great after the first time I left that night. I felt kind of one percent better. So I kind of made a commitment to go back the following week. And if I'd not done that, who's to say what would have happened? But the the reality is now that my literally my favorite thing in the world is taking my son to watch Wrexham. And when we talk about the football club, when we talk about community. In, in the hole, I walked through the door because I had postnatal depression and, and that led me to suicide, led me to really struggling being a dad. And then actually now I get to watch my son play football on a Saturday morning and then I get to take him to the race course. Like, and, and there's just no better way to spend a Saturday. And, and it's places like Andy's Man Club. And don't forget that we've got Dragon Chat actually at the mm. that's, that's we'll loosely say part of the football club. Myself and Steve Lloyd set up Dragon Chat three years ago now and um, unfortunately, the, the football club don't even advertise that Dragon Chat exists anymore, other than hidden away in the, in on on the on the website. And within Dragon Chat, you've got a Wrexham specific mental health group that sees guys from America, from Canada. It's brought football fan, Wrexham fans together from around the world to support each other. Wrexham have season ticket holders of guys that met up through Dragon Chat, and the best thing is now they they provide actually a space at the Miners Rescue before each game so between one and two on a Saturday and I think it's from about half six on a midweek game you can go to the minors and you can they've got a separate room so if you do struggle with things like alcohol or addiction and things along those lines actually you can go and get a brew and sit down and have a chat with the lads from with the lads from Dragon Chat so you, you think about all those kind of things that you put together as a community with Wrexham being the the, the kind of center of that which which is hugely important, which I think a lot and Steve Lloyd especially at Dragon Chat should be should be hugely proud of what they provided for the football club. Wow. I mean, yeah. This is the heart of what a community club should 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 do and should be, isn't it? Um Dan, I know I know Tim sort of touched on it. Social media, I mean, in, in many ways it it can really help people because you can you can find that like, aid there, but but in other ways, it, it's a horrible cesspit <laughs> as well, where where people people like to be offended, people like to take issue with things, and and that can sort of get get you down. I mean, how how do you sort of how do you sort of see it, and how 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 what advice do you give to sort of survive social media? Wow, how long have you got, Andy? Um, I could probably say that the, the first part of that question is that the reality is, if, if we take Andy's Man Club, for instance, like I mentioned before, we've got 154 clubs. I reckon we'd have 50 if it wasn't for social media. If you look at the impact that social media has, we, we ask everyone that walks through the door for the first time, how have you heard about AMC? Just so that we can get a gauge of what's working, what can we do more of? Um, and that's the only bit of information, really, that we ask for anyone. Everyone else can be anonymous, really. Um and and the reality is social media media plays a huge role in in promoting that there is space out there. Um, from a personal point of view, um, I have a, a, a challenge with social media. Um, I, I think that you tend to find that 
um, like you've just described there, people are very quick to shout about how important mental health is. And then the next conversation, they're calling someone or whatever they might be calling somebody um, for, for whatever for whatever reason. And we see that with football fans, don't we? We see that a lot with with our, our own players. Where I sit in the Wrexham Lager stand, we always make the joke that um, if Elliot Lee was treated in the same way that James Jones was treated around where we were, every time he, he loses the ball, then he wouldn't be the player that he was today. And you, you take that to social media. Where as soon as a player mispasses a, a ball, Mark Howard comes out and misses the ball, whatever that kind of might be. The the, the ambush on that is, is huge. But then you take that from a personal point of view. You mentioned there, um, Tim, about saying something that isn't malicious. But the thing with social media, you have to have an extreme voice to be heard. And I think that's the the real challenge is you can't be balanced. You can't be um because you'll get shot down for for for, yeah. for balance. And, and and I think that's the challenge when it comes to that. Is that I, mean, I genuinely believe that 90% of the comments people don't actually mean they're just doing it to be heard. Yeah, I think that there's a perception element to it. I mean, you you only have to have a misplaced comma or an accidental exclamation mark at the end of something. It changes the entire context of a tweet to somebody. That's that's the hard part. And just going back to what you said, then it's it's important because let's say for 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 example, yesterday we lo- let's say we lost the game at Crawley, right? And Andy Cannon gets sent off after six minutes, right? All of a sudden, you've got a scapegoat there, yeah. irrespective of whatever has gone on before and after it. That is the scapegoat. It would be yeah. well, we could have we could have won it, we could have held on if 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 he hadn't got sent off and been stupid, and he would have got clobbered. I'm not, I can't remember if Andy Cannon's on social media or, or whatever, but he would have got stick. And if people want to find out about um, how a fan base thinks of them, they can go and seek it out very, very easily. So I, I'm always mindful of do not hang a player out to dry or do not throw him under the bus massively. If they've had a bad game or a bad moment, then you see it as that. But that's yeah. that. It's bookended. You don't do a uh, you know a sort of hatchet job on somebody. And we yeah. see that all too often. Um, uh, Neil's alluded to it before with the whole captaincy and, and, and relegation and, and the whole uh, cloud that followed in with that, you know, and, and, and it's happening. It still happens. It still happens. And we could apply it to James McLean as a prime example of somebody who gets dog's abuse yep. through his beliefs. How he's, how he's come through it is beyond me. Well, I think that there's a there's a real challenge, isn't there? There and and Neil know this better than than everyone else. But I can imagine and only imagine being a footballer. But I could imagine that the first person that knows when they've made a mistake is the player. Nobody yeah. makes nobody makes a mistake on purpose. No one goes into a tackle thinking I'm purposely going to get sent off. Although there were a lot of rumours around Christmas time, weren't there, about for twenty years. <laughs> But, but generally, we won't name the player. Dan. Name the player. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but generally, that that doesn't happen. You don't need to go onto social media and threaten a player because he's made a mistake. Because I, I imagine professional professional footballers know far more about professional football than us idiots in the stand sometimes. And while it's frustrating and and we live and breathe it, I, I think it's I think it's it's really important that we remember that a lot of these lads as well, they're, they're young men. Like they're, they're, I don't know what you guys were like, but when I was in my early 20s, I, I didn't know my ass from my elbow. Like I was still trying to work out who I was, never mind have 10,000 people calling me this, that and the other because I've misplaced a pass. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a mad environment, isn't it? You wouldn't get it in any other walk of life. You just wouldn't get it. And that, that's, that's the terrifying thing, like you said, yeah. that they are young. And, and they are still learning and I'm sure Neil kind of concurs with everything you just said because you've been through it yourself Neil haven't you like not not just that example we keep going back to but I imagine there's other times as well yeah absolutely I think um human beings right and um ultimately you know we all have um we all have moments in time that either we regret or um, are mistakes and um yeah the first thing I think the majority of us want to do is put it right and um if there's if there's a continuous sort of let's call it a witch hunt for want of a better phrase, then it does catch up with you. And I think it I think it's very difficult to shake it off. Um, and I, we've only got to look at one of our own sort of Mark Howard in that. In that, I think I think he's found it really difficult to shake off the sort of um, tag that he's been given as 
you know, as, as not being good enough potentially. And when we all know he is, it's just a case of actually he went through a bad spell. That's, you know, that, that can't be argued and it does happen, but what does he need then? Well, I tell you what he needs. He needs people to get around him and support him. And, you know, the, you know, you know, what Dan has alluded to with, with Andy's man club is that, you know, when you walk into an environment like Andy's man club, they, there will be an array of different personalities there and let's get it right. Whoever that person is in the stand shouting at Mark Howard obscenities or whatever he's shouting, I bet your bottom dollar, he's probably struggling deep down and there might be something with him that that is released to go to the football and take it out on, on somebody else. And, um, you know, that, that the only reason that I say that is that just comes from experience, right? You kind of, yeah, I probably wouldn't have thought about that a number of years ago. Um, it would have been if somebody was shouting something and I was in the stand, I'd have probably had a had an argument. But many ways now, I think I've learned to take a step back and kind of go, yeah, maybe maybe things aren't so great with them. You know, it's football and football stadiums are social media at its absolute worst. I, th- far, I think, worst. yeah, I, I was just going to say, I, I think. James Jones' situation from the end of last season just highlights that. And, and nobody knew, well, certainly as a, a general fan, nobody knew that his son was born and was in hospital for, what, four months, three months, four months? He was turning up for training. He was giving it his all. He was turning up on a Saturday, turning up on a Tuesday, where, quite rightly, if that that's me, I'm not turning up for work, if my son is, is struggling in. So... When, when we think about that and we think about the praise that James Jones got from the general fan base when it came out exactly what yeah. he'd been going through and he'd been turning up and he'd been giving it his all. And then, so we when we think about that, why don't we think about, well, actually, maybe people are going through some challenges. Maybe like one of the players is going through a tough time. So instead of at five o'clock or 10 past five, whenever a game finishes nowadays, um, instead of going straight onto social media to call somebody an idiot to say that you've ruined, they've ruined your day or your weekend or that they're whatever they are, mm-hmm. why don't we just take a moment to think, well, actually, A, would I say it to their face if they were stood right in front of me? And B, do you know what? Maybe maybe they've got something going on. So do I need to say that? It's a, it's a really interesting one because... You know, you could, some people will say maybe the club could do a little bit more in terms of sharing certain elements of information, letting it become public knowledge that there's something's going on. You know, we've got so many examples at at Wrexham at the moment and it's, you know, Fordy. You know, we look back what Fordy's going through with, you know, with his partner. You've got Ben Dozer losing his father. You know, you've got Jordan Davis going through what he went through with, with their young baby uh, losing their their baby prematurely, um, you've got James Jones, you've got Moles, and you know because because Moles has sort of been very vocal about his, there's more of an appreciation and an understanding for it. But just because those other four choose not to, yeah, be public about it, maybe there's something that the club I don't know. Maybe they need a bit more protection. I always thought that. If somebody's going through what Ben Sosa was going through, I don't think then it's the player's choice to play. I think there's an element of maybe as a manager sort of saying, I think I think we need to bring you out for a couple of games and just let you have some time off. I, football's not important when things like that happen. It isn't. I don't care about promotion. I don't care about any of that. When it comes to families, when it comes to life and death, it, it doesn't come close. And... Um, yeah, I think the whole sort of the whole game needs to uh, to look at that, and and fans as well. You know, it's yeah. I don't know how many fans would agree with me when I say that, but you know what? It's like you've got to put things in perspective, and you know, going, going through those sort of traumas can you know, yeah. it, can, it, can, it, can, it it stays with you. It, it never leaves, right? So um, I think. I definitely think the club would have taken Tozer out. I think there was a few injuries that that, that maybe there was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that meant he had to play on a little bit. And I think as soon, 
as people came back, he Parky did look to take him out. I don't think yeah. you know, I don't think he'll play on Tuesday. I think he'll have that sort of reset period. But I see yeah. what you're saying. I mean, just because there's injuries doesn't mean that the that this fella has to put, yeah, put Max Clowerth in. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Test him. I mean, if he's if he's yeah, as but... good as if he's as good as we say he is, play him. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and I know that's a little bit it's a little bit sort of um I don't know what the word is, but maybe he's be, me being a little bit sort of tongue in cheek. But I just think you have to cope. You have to you have to manage. And I don't think Ben Toza played particularly bad either. I've got to say that. I just yeah. think I just don't think he was in the right space. And uh, I don't know. I, I he needed I, he needed a break. I think he needed, he needed a break. break. Yeah. He needed a break away. Absolutely, from, yeah, from, yeah. absolutely. And he deserves the other break thing that away, that yeah. sort of sums it up for. For me on social media, and we'll probably we'll probably wrap it up soon. But mm. just you know, you have the guy who shouts the comment because you've misplaced the pass, or, yeah. or you know, you, you've taken the booking or something like that, and that's that's horrible. But it's gone. It's gone within five seconds. Yeah. And unless it's you know constant through the game, a player can can sort of survive that or or, or move on from it. But social media amplifies it much more mm. than the ninety minutes, and it's mm. there for. It, it, it's there for weeks, you know, as, as you say, you can go searching for it. it. It's just more constant, constantly out there. And I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't know if, if even regulators should be doing more rather than, you know, you say, what can the club do? Well, is it yeah. more of a, more of a thing that. I think we've got to take personal responsibility. We've got to take personal responsibility though, Andy, haven't we? We've got to take personal responsibility for that. Um, I, I, I think there's an element without getting too deep into the the, the in, into, into from a social media company point of view. But um, what we do know is that bad news travels faster than good news. Hate travels right. faster yeah. than 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 love, so to speak. So the social media companies were much more likely to promote hate because it has more interactions. And by the fact that it has more interactions, mean that they can sell more advertising, which means they can be more profitable and all these kind of things. So. If you ever look at social media and realize that, oh my God, 99% of my feed is all negative, it's because you're much more likely, and as a human, we're much more likely to interact with something that is hateful than we are that's a good that that's yeah. a good so it's a good thing. So if if, if you had two people put a, a comment, Mark Howard is rubbish, Mark Howard is good then I can guarantee you that the Mark Howard is rubbish one will reach a bigger audience because people are more likely to interact with it. And and that's from a, a social media company. Can they change their algorithms? They can. Yeah. Are they going to? No. I, I think the, the answer is, is, is really it's personal responsibility. Think twice before sending that because A, we don't know what people's going through. And and is it really beneficial? Like, um, sorry, Tim's just said there, if I shout at a player for missing a pass, A, I'm not close enough to the pitch that he won't even hear me anyway. It's more my own frustration. But the reality, the reality is he'll be that involved in the game that he'll make a good pass, he'll get a cheer, and, and, we, and we kind of all move on. But on social media, and then it's not just one comment, is it one person comments, and then everyone's got to jump on it. And oh, buy then, it. Yeah, it piles on. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the uh, that's that that's a challenge. But I think it's really important. It's World Mental Health Day on Tuesday for those that don't know. Um, so th hence the reason why Tim's kindly invited um, me on, and and maybe it's just a time that we all think one of the themes of World Mental Health Day this year is the power of community. As a football club, we talk a lot about community. Um, my personal opinion is I don't think we deliver on that as a as a football club. However, I think that there's enough within the Wrexham community to support individuals. And when we talk about certainly the male side of, of the community, then Andy's Man Club every week, seven till nine on a, on a Monday night um, for you to go and, and talk. You don't need to book. All you need to do is turn up, drag and chat again every Thursday before every game. Go and meet. Go and meet people. Go and talk to people. Go and realise that mental health makes you feel like you're the, the only person that goes through whatever you're going through. It makes you feel so isolated. Actually walking through the door and realising there's 30 guys on a Monday night sat at yellow and blue talking about effectively the same stuff that you're going through. It takes that weight off your shoulders and it realises that actually there's a lot more good. You've just got to find it sometimes and providing these spaces, something at, at AMC we're, we're hugely proud of as well. So, so well, there's a thing... Yeah. Yeah, no, 
can't can't argue with that. Great stuff. So yeah, we'll we'll mental health day on Tuesday. I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, promotion around that and trying to bring uh, more spotlight to to that day and everything surrounding it. So yeah, keep an eye on that. And yeah, you know, it's the classic. It's okay to to not be okay, isn't it? As as as, as it keeps going by. So speak out, speak up. Our yeah. DMs are open on Twitter and all that. So anybody struggling, get in touch as well, as well as the, yeah. the outlet that, that you've mentioned. Should we end with predict- predictions? Yeah, I was just getting to predictions. We've got plenty to predict. So we've got well, we've got the EFL trophy game against Crew away on Tuesday night. We've then got Wales yeah. Gibraltar Wednesday and the small matter of Salford City at home on Saturday. So right. um, in the spirit of community, which we just mentioned with the mental health aspect, let's get everybody's uh, predictions. Andy, go on. Seeing as you got last week so correct. I did. I got I got them by them on, didn't I? But I did say 3 0 away at Crawley. Um I knew yeah. we'd do Crawley. Uh just had a feeling. <laughs> right. Um so EFL trophy. Uh, part of me thinks I don't care, but if we get to Wembley, I'll be the first person there with two foam fingers. So um <laughs> I can't really look down on it at the moment. Uh away at crew, yeah. Uh, yes. Not like the way you don't know. It's away at crew, yeah. <laughs> um I think I think I think it's a draw. Uh, well, it has to be one. It has to be one on the on the night. I'll win on penalties then. I think okay. the, I think he'll rest a few with with Saturday in mind. Um, and then I think home at Salford. I really want to do these just because I think we owe them from the non-league. Uh, I'm going to go three-one. Mm, okay, okay, Neil. Wales. Um, well, sorry, we're going to do Wales. Do Wales. Yeah, yeah. I'm done Wales. Uh, Wales. It's Gibraltar. <laughs> It's going to be tougher than people think. I think we'll 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 leak it out. I think it will be two 0 and I'd love to see Mullin get the second. Oh, Neil, what are you thinking? Um, crew, crew first. Yeah, crew game. Um, I'm going to go two one. I think I think there'll be a lot of changes, but I just think yeah. we've got too much strength in depth. Um, I think Jordan Davis will uh, will get a start, and uh, fancy him yeah. to get a couple on Tuesday. Um, the Welsh game. Yeah, I, I think I think we'll win. But I think it'll be fairly tight, so I, I'd probably go with a one nil. Um, I'd love Mullers to come off the bench and get the winner, obvious obvious reasons. But um, yeah, and then following that Saturday, um, Salford's going to be a tough one. There's always goals at the race course, right? So I'm, unfortunately, I still, I still think we could concede. So I'm not going to be naive and say three nil. I'm going to go three two, win. Ooh. Three, two, Cracking five, go another fireworks yeah. game. Why not? Why not, Dan? Um, I think we'll beat Crew one nil. I think there'll be a whole host of changes on both sides. I think it'll be fairly disjointed, but I think we'll win one nil. Uh, Wales, I'm going to be optimistic. Um, and probably heart ruling the head on this one, but I'm going to go six nil with Mullin hat trick. Wow! <laughs> Absolutely wow! <laughs> I don't know whether that's optimistic or uh, or what, maybe significantly, but hey, we can dream, can't we? Um, and then Salford, um, before I think the weekend, they were really struggling, but then they battered crew, didn't they? I think on on Saturday so yesterday. So um, I do think we'll win. I think we'll win two 0 I think we'll we'll keep the clean sheets um, going as well. Nice, nice. I'm going to kind of think we're going to lose at crew. I don't know why. I think they're still slightly annoyed that we nicked the point and should have beaten them with 10 men the other week. So I think that might work in their favour and think they're going to get one over us. So I think I think we might lose there 2-1 or on penalties. But yeah, I think we might lose there um, despite the raft of changes. I think when, when we've seen before, we make a lot of changes. It's not quite cohesive. So um, I think we'll lose there. I think, I think Wales Gibraltar, I think without Mullin, We'll win 2-1 with Mullin. We'll win 3-1. <laughs> and he comes off the bench and scores. However, now this this is the permutation. If he comes off the bench or he has an effect or he, he plays well in that game, all of a sudden he's involved for Croatia on Sunday. So he will not be in the picture for the Salford game. So, again, <laughs> if Mullin is included for um, the Salford game and he's not including the Wales game, I think we win it 3-1. If we haven't got Mullin uh, and he's including for the Wales game against Croatia, I think we still win, but I think it'll be a one niller and we're going to go for a, a third clean sheet in a row. So there's my slightly 
uh, sliding doors, mathematician all over the place predictions. But that's a good cross cross sort of breed of, of predictions there. They're, they're pretty wild. So, but I think I like on the, the only the right hand down, down. my favourite. Yeah, I'm, I don't think I think we're, we're past writing them down. We started doing that, and then <laughs> I think uh, the season before last, Reese didn't do his forfeit, so he kind of undermined the entire thing. When Dan said his six nil, I gave a little Brady bunch look down to him then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you never know. You never know. Gotta be optimistic on these things, haven't you? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And right. it couldn't be any worse. It couldn't be any worse than the last game of the race course. The Trinidad game was awful. So we won it, but right. it was awful. We'll see. I've got tickets for uh, for Arsenal City, so I'm gonna have to go. Uh, <laughs> same coat. Um, Come on, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, look, you know, it's been great. It's been a really fascinating um, episode. Um, from a personal point of view, um, it's resonated a lot. You know, yeah. I'll quite go and reckon say I've had a, a lot of my own issues in in recent months and maybe year, eighteen months or so. Um, so yeah, it does help to to chat it out. Um, and even this has got elements of a of a sort of extended counselling session, if you like. So it's been great. Um, I hope everybody listening to it gets something from it as well. So please subscribe, like, Definitely. leave a comment, all that jazz. And just want to thank um, Neil and Dan for, for joining us. So cheers, lads. And uh, up to time. Up thank you time. again. Thank you. Cheers.